Certainly we're thrilled to be collaborating with the Academy as it celebrates 40 years young, I have to say, under its in incomparable artistic director Mira Pushik, OBE, and her marvellous team. Uh, some of whom, Nina and Juba and Apollonia, are here this evening, but of course there's many, many others involved who ensure that the Academy remains the leading dynamic South Asian dance organisation in the country and beyond. It's also such an exciting night for us that the Academy launched their Dance Dialogue series tonight. Importantly, cultural exchange and dance as a vehicle for social change lie at the heart of your activities. And the same with Asia House, we uh, cross disciplinary, we embrace the arts of over 40 countries of Asia. So it's delightful to welcome two incredible artists this evening, who's going to be introduced by Mira to discuss their and demonstrate a journey through Indian dance. And we're also delighted to have three amazing musicians to accompany us this evening. So welcome to Mira to say a few words in the chat. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, yes, uh, as Pamela said, we are transporting this year, and it's a privilege to be starting this whole series of dancing dialogues uh, here at this place. Um, I am also here to thank a set of uh, patrons who have been part of this whole uh, project, which is Arts Council, Cocaine, London Community Foundation, ICCR, the Hindu Center, High Commission of India, and uh, many other friends who have been uh, supporting us. Now my job is to introduce the artist and the first artist which I would like to introduce is Chitra Sundaram. Chitra Sundaram is not only a mentor, an artist, a dancer, a choreographer. Sorry? I will just enter. <laughs> she, she has been a trustee of the Academy, a founder of the Academy. Um, and this is the moment. <laughs> and Dr. Swarn Maria Ganesh, who is the artist visiting us from India. Dr. Soramaya Ganesh is not only a very well established scholar, uh, a PhD on Sadhir, but she is also an established performer in theatre, in Indian cinema, um, and a famous Bharatanatyam dancer. So, Dr. Soramaya Ganesh, as she enters up, So, as she enters,
Sorry, Kate. Delighted to have you here. And all of you. And I actually want to say it's such a special event today. In a few years, we'll be talking about it in the most historic terms. Because it's the first time we are going to witness in the UK a series of items which come from what we call the Southern Repertoire. When I first started learning Bharatanatyam, that name was not even mentioned, or it was mentioned or mentioned in the passing as Sadhiratam. And on the way back, you don't know need that, you don't even know about it. That is how it was talked about. And there are enough reasons for which, and hopefully we'll talk about it during the rest of the evening. But the primary purpose here is, as the story goes, you know, um, the African saying, which actually comes from the Aryan language, which is the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter until the lion gets its own narrator. And it's not necessarily that the lion was a subaltern here, which also it might have been. But they say the hunter is strong, powerful, clever. The lion is also the king of the jungle. But on that particular day, he actually knows what happened in the jungle. So, when Reformation, when modern modernity met these southern dances, what actually happened? We've so far received only a very, very partial history, particularly the performers, who typically into their notes put what they read in Wikipedia, and in um, even recent articles, Wendy, such as William Dalrymple, uh, who are referred to what we call sacred prostitution, and there are other mythologies about the whole thing, such as um, all the women who danced were Devadasis. They were all attached to temples. They did sacred performances. Um, mythologies such as um, they were all really wealthy, they were well paid. That everyone from a particular community um, danced or learned dancing, as it was the easiest thing to do. And how it was an area of agency because it was major media. And then we have Dr. Abhuti Meduri here, whose first work from 1996 started talking about them as subalterns, as people who are not really in charge of their own agency. And a lot of work has been done among the scholars, such as herself, and others, and now the other scholars, such as Vardhamaya, which brings us a view of what actually happened. And there's so much evidence that was not taken on board. It was ignored. The dance that happened in the salons, which really were the reason for people to say, let's stop this kind of dancing, because what was the repertoire of the salon? Which was meant for entertainment, an educated, sophisticated audience, like yourselves, um, who were not necessarily going there to, to pray, because just because they refer to a god, they were not going to watch ballet so they could pray to, you know, even if it was a Christmas story to Jesus Christ. So, my agenda for bringing Swarnamalia here and more importantly her southern repertoire, because that's what she performs, is pretty much threefold. One, this is the 40th year for Academy, and Nira has been consistently over the years trying to keep, worked very hard, adjusting, negotiating to keep South Asian dance relevant in Britain. And we have come almost full circle in India, as India is a young country. It's only 70 years old. We, with, with, with our own ownership of the agency, it's only 70 years old. So a lot of things are still just happening. And we find right now, we can talk about these Devadasis and, and, and get the performers to not feel, oh my god, what are we learning, what are we teaching? Not look upon it as something salacious, but equally laugh at, at some of the lyrics that were included in those performances. But I wanted to bring, because it's a paradigm shift, I just thought it's a wonderful, fitting gift to Mira Kaushi, who has led this institution and is now, I wanted, I wanted the fact that Southern came to England to be associated as my gift with Academy. So that was one reason why I went after her and said we need to bring her. 
uh, bring this one on the air. The second was to highlight that when Sadr has been watched by Bharatanatyam dancers, usually they say, oh, it looks like poor Bharatanatyam. Oh, the lines are not straight. It's like saying, oh, what do you see bends too much? Oh, Mohini are convinced too much. Oh, Kathakali makes big faces. But that was the genre. So we need to, I'm not historicizing, but we need to understand the pedagogy, the repertoire, the purpose of what was happening at that point in time, and also learn from when it started shifting. From, we have a record, and also the third aspect for me was to destroy some of the mythologies. To at least let you know that there is evidence out there, and you can go and find out for yourself that if all the dancing women were not Devadasis, that term didn't come into print and silence till early 20th century. Uh, my teacher would never use Devadasi, he would use the word Rudra Even that was used because Annie Besson had already forced him on these women the whole notion that they were like Buddhist monks, they were like Christian nuns, devoted to God, and their job was to bring religion to mankind, and somehow they fell into degenerate uh, performances of less vicious um, works, which are actually very clever, cute, feminist, sharp. So the idea we hear right now is to look at the repertoire. You can read the history by yourself afterwards, but we want to spend a lot of time today Talk a little bit about the Reformation, what it is, how it impacted over the centuries, but more importantly about the repertoire and the works that are on them, of themselves. To recognize that we, although we talk about Devadasis from say the 5th century onwards in, in our Wikipedia information, we really find out that when, when Ferdinand starts off our research, which is going to go into it, we start off from about the 16th century. From that, that's the period from when onwards we have actual evidence of Dasis, of who was Dasis, names of women, where did their so-called dedication take place, what did that dedication actually mean, and so on and so forth. So, although it's fractured, it's a fascinating history. And so we're going to spend a lot more time on your research today. Um, today we're going to spend more time on your research of the last 12 years and your practice and the pieces and why we've chosen them to come and perform here. So after my setup now, Dr. Swagamaya, Ganesh. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, in fact, I think I, I'm stunned for words with so much gratitude to all the wonderful uh, people who have thought of not just bringing me uh, to London. To me, this is my first Debbie performance in London, so it's very, very special on a very personal note. But I think uh, in so many ways, this is the coming home for uh, Sadir. Not that I carry the entire credit or the burden of that on my uh, shoulders, but Sadir has such a wonderful connection with this country. And in so many ways, to bring it back here uh, means so much and uh, for scholars like Chitraji and for Avantiji who has been working on, on Sadir and Devadasis for so many years, uh, who was like a pioneer in this uh, particular domain. Uh, I'm sure she also feels a sense of emotional uh, moment when Sadir, as Sadir can be brought. Sadir has been brought, I'm sure, around the world in so many other forms. It is old wine in so many different new bottles over the decades um, with so many different avatars. But for me, I started learning uh, Bharatanatyam. I was told I was learning Bharatanatyam very specifically, but I learned from the age of three with uh, a guru who comes from the Devadasi lineage. But interestingly, she always kept hiding her identity and she, she kept camouflaging her original identity with her very urban, city, uh, sort of uh, modern identity. So as I was growing up and I had acquired this repertoire and uh, then, then organically, she, although she kept saying she's a Bharatanatyam guru, she kept teaching us other. So uh, when I grew up and I realized that what I was learning was distinct from the way 
it was contextualized. I went back to her and questioned her, and she was very upset. She said, let's not talk about this. And you, especially, shouldn't be talking about this because you come from a very different, higher class of a background, and I don't want your parents to take you out of my class. So that was actually the very beginning, and I realized that I was learning something that I was not allowed to talk about. So this disconnect really stuck with me, and when the time was right, um, and I had the opportunity to academically delve into this, um, I went back to her, she again turned her back on me, so I realized that I had to seek other people. And seeking other people wasn't easy, uh, because the other people weren't quite there. Uh, they were there, people were talking about them, but one didn't know where to find these women or these dance masters. Because those who had come to the city had so well meshed themselves with the urban uh, Bharatanatyam scene that they seldom wanted to talk about the past. Right, so talking to them was, was no good because they were regurgitating the new, new found history. So I went back and uh, after several doors shutting on my face, uh, I have actually written about these experiences, very interesting experiences. I uh, spent a few years working with the Tirvanapadur Kalyani granddaughters, two women, uh, very nondescript, so to speak, from uh, who lived in Kumbakonam. And they, for the longest time, they didn't want to be identified as Devadasi. They said they are daughters of Udaya because that was very uh, respectful. Uh, so then they started teaching me, and through that journey, I realized. I was not just interested in their repertoire. It was not the repertoire alone, because as I learned the repertoire, I realized that the music and the dance felt like I was taking it away from them. I was almost stealing from them. So, um, as any other researcher from Tamil Nadu would say, the holy grail of uh, uh, dance research for most of us is going back to the Chola period, because nobody knows what happened during the Chola period. So, everybody wants to be a part of that. Right? So I wanted to jump on that back again, but um, as uh, fate would have it, I realized there was nothing that I could uh, concretely find in the Chola. So I came rolling down to several centuries, about 600 years to be precise, and I was very uninterested in this 150-200 years of history between 16th and 17th, 18th centuries that happened in Tamil Nadu, which was ruled at that time by Telugu kings called the Nayaks. 200 years of nobody ruling us. Yeah, we thought this was 3,000 years old. <laughs> yes. So these 200 years really felt like nothing to me, and I felt like, oh, I'm too close to Bhagavatam. I want to be as far. I want to talk about the gory past and the extant, uh, you know, uh, history of the uh, fall. And then I realized, as I kept looking, that it was here in these 400 years from here to then that the immediate cultural memory of anything that we have as classical music or dance really lies. One is not able to take it any further than that. If one wants to take it any further than that, then you know you do literally like a 911 call to Nati Shastra and say, hey, I'm here, so let's just connect directly from here to the Nati Shastra, which is what we've been actually doing. The Nati Shastra doesn't recognize Nati Shastra does not talk about uh, Bharatanatyam, it does not talk about Sadhana, it does not talk about dance even. It talks about a very different dramaturgical uh, version of dance. Not that there is no connection between Nati Shastra and current forms, but the, the root is so, uh, is, it, it passes through so many other journeys that without looking at those journeys, it is almost as if we are, we are uh, uh, taking away the flesh of this form. So that's how the nine period research happened. So my entire uh, PhD dissertation was on reconstructing. Why reconstruction? Because the women who were teaching me Southern were not, they, they had no memory of the Naya Kida either, because that was 200 years before them. So it, I had to reconstruct it. But I can't take credit for this reconstruction because without having learned with them, if I had learned in an institution, for example, uh, you know, which taught Bharatanatyam. I would have not had this sort of, um, how do I put it, this kinesthetic experience to be able to to visualize what we could be coming back to. Yeah, for me. Yes. Oh, no, I'm not going to talk about the yeah. okay. So, so that is my. So I mean, to just give you an example of Nai because we will be going into later periods. Other. Yeah. So, um, the the period was just so. Wild. 
vibrant. What we today consider as a Hindu dance, what we consider today as sort of uh, closely connected to the religiosity of a particular uh, religion, the, the, the spirituality, is really, um, is really a myth. A construct. It's a construct. So if you look at, for example, a form called Chakki, a repertoire called Chakki during the Nile era, clearly it says that Chakki has Persian influence, Islamic influence. Now it didn't say that, I had to find that out, but that's a long story. So I will just cut it short and say that the repertoire of Jakini, the, the 19 prototypes of Jakini we have today at the Saraswati Mahal Manuscript Library, all of them have these Persian lyrics in them. Except for a hundred years, including somebody like Vitapa Sir, did not know that it was Persian language. They thought it was just, yeah, they thought it was syllables. Yeah. So when it said Elilam, Elilam Lale, he thought these were syllables, but actually Elilam, Elilam Lale is Ilahi, Ilahi. This is Persian. So, so this kind of reconstruction really opened my eyes to the fact that I was performing a dance form that, that really belonged to just that state to which it, it has been claimed. So and also as we would find that we are so, I, mean, I would love for you to do a piece of Japanese, but just to plant this idea that we talk so much about pure Bhagavad and pure this and pure that, the beauty of, of what we have coming from that Indian subcontinent is that nothing is pure. It knows how to take these various aspects and make their own. And just as we may cricket our own in in India, especially the 2020 and the limited over matches, um, I think I think India has because it's had this confluence of so many cultures. So could we see a bit of the Japanese and then we um, sure we okay, could. Uh, or maybe we should do Gondal because okay. we right, we do Gondal. But um, I mean, just to add to what you were saying, the idea that I mean. Purity is a very elitist idea. And Southern is it stands quite opposite to the other end of that spectrum. So if you look at Southern, it's it's more like it's vitality, uh, uh, as I see it, because every aspect of life itself, uh, the, the various encounters, um, the assimilations, the languages, the cultures, have all been uh, very uh, evolutionarily uh, peppered in this form that you know one one is always fascinated by what one is finding and no two dancers in no two areas are doing the same thing so it's really a, a wealth of so much to know from um, so we thought we do a small portion of Gondhal. Gondhal like Japani has a very fascinating history. Gondhali was uh, formed with, uh, by by the dancers in the Nile court um, about 300 years ago and it was actually even performed in the Maratha though. Yeah, I was just a little bit, but, but it definitely changed a little bit. But this is in Marathi. We had a huge Marathi population in India. We still do in Tamil Nadu. And we had Maratha rulers. Yes. In, in. But fascinatingly, the Marathi people settled in Tamil Nadu uh, at least 150 years before the, the kings became kings. So we had the language with us. And it's not just the language, if you look at the movements, as I show you, the movements, you might recognize these to be uh, for a train, but not a mind, they might look folksy. But each of these movements have uh, a, a name and it's part of, uh, you know, if you look at the Kratnavali, a medieval text, it gives you the, the movements, names, and it's, it's very fascinating to see how this uh, this particular dance can reconstruct itself, look very lavadi ish and still remain within the confines of what they call as Shuddha Padati or pure, as I would like to call it, but it be all form. So this was Margam. So the Tanjo Quartet's Margam was preceded by several other Margams, and this is one of them. I'm just going to do a minute or two.
is uh, in the NIAC uh, port. Yes. But it also continued into the Sarfoji port because I was just reading that till at least the 1900s there were five genres that off of courtly entertainment that was prevalent in the port. One was drama, which included Bhagavad Gita Vatikam, uh, Lavani, which is part of the Bharata port. It's the Marathi genre of love songs. Um, which is again has got very much like a Javi, which you will see, very, it's got all those very fussy movements and, and uh, uh, vocabulary. Then it's got Bondi, which is, by the time it comes to the Poji, it's men doing ritual drumming, because Lavani has taken over the women's dancing. Then they had North Indian or Hindustani music and dance. At that point in time, the South was already looking to the North to see, yes, there is certain kinds of sophisticated ways of doing things and ideas that they have that were already getting influenced from there. And then, of course, there was Western music and dance. And um, they used to have these grand ballroom parties because these were, don't forget, we need to not just see this, but see also the historic sense of what was happening at the time. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could say, when you say it happens in the 1600s, think of it. Not even ruling India at that point in time. And these kings were already getting their chandeliers from France and they were getting, you know, getting their pearls from here and shipping this and getting that and so much of trade was going on. So it was not happening in an area where everybody was doing that to say, oh my god, this is going to happen in my region and region alone. One king traveled to the other one, the emissary came and said, I saw this dancer and she did this, or I heard this music and it sounded like this. And the king promptly said, I want to commission a piece, which sounds exactly like that, which is very, very common. So it was very alive in the way. I also wanted to talk about the instrument. I thought this would be a good point. Sure. So, I mean, we obviously, we are a small team uh, with us today. Um, when we reconstructed the dances, obviously the music wouldn't remain uh, 21st century because that wouldn't be fair. I mean, the music really is the bedrock on which the form is. Created. So the Sangeeta Mail is really how the Nayak um, period looked at the musical ensemble. We had several instruments um, like the Titi and the Bilakurubi and all of that, all of which we are unable to bring here. So when we reconstructed the Sangeeta Mail, the Harnakam of course is a very interesting instrument that came from Parsi theatrical tradition to the south. And, uh, Sadhir so immediately sort of grabbed it and it was part of uh, both the Baroda tradition where uh, Sadhir went to Baroda with the dancers and they used harmonium there and for a long time it was used both in Parsi theatre, Tamil theatre and Sadhir performances in the South. So we were very lucky to start working with uh, Sri Krishna and we have uh, Guru Bharadvaja Gandhi and Sangeeta on the vocal. Uh, this is a very small team but the Sangeeta Madam is Reconstructing the Sangeeta Melon is very fascinating, so it's not just them sitting together and singing, but it's uh, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of an ensemble. Today we use the word ensemble, right? And Melon, that's what it meant. Yes. They had the Pinya Melon, which had the big drums and the and the Nadasura. and the dancers orchestra ensemble was called the Chinna Melon. Chinna Melon. Yeah, but but they they always work together, isn't it? The they did. But interestingly, the Chinna Melon. During the night period, the, the, the Chinnamayam was actually not rather big. So we had lots of instruments. They also had the Rudravina and they had several other instruments. Uh, so from time to time, we just sort of swap between different... Uh, I'm actually reading that by the time of Tulaja, mm -hmm. 1764, the instruments that were played in the court, Sakpat, anyone knows the Sakpat? Irish pipe, the harp, the clarinet, which is what you're trying to bring back, the French horn, trumpet, fiddle, not violin, fiddle, piano. Yes. So this was the the fervent, the fervent, the fervent that was happening right. in terms of music as well as the. Dance. Which is why we're going to have the mandolin with us on the concert day. Yes, on 28th and the 30th, because the mandolin, of course, was not part of this ensemble. But something like I said is so giving that you know you can envision it. it it is not a tradition that's stuck in time. It really is, uh, like King Leo would say, the ebb and flow. This is true. 
in fact, um, before I give you the, uh, we'd like to go to uh, Tanjavur and, and patronage. In, when we talk about Sadar a lot, Tanjavur or Tanjavur port, which comes you know, with some food really into ferment, and when the, all the technical virtuosity of the Swarajati starts. In fact, the Swarajati was done by uh, a Brahmin composer, and you will find, although we talk about the cast of dancers and others, it was, they became a community through their dancing um, and, 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 their, and their practices, rather than a particular cast of community started taking up um, dance. But you will find there was a lot of the composition was done in classical music, uh, what we call classical music, and as Rohini Rathri says, there was no word classical before the uh, 19th century, so which, which was done in that Hindustani or Carnatic music, which is the right way to talk about it, was all done by these Brahmin uh, composers who were Bhagi who composed music as well as write the text for it. And, um, I, uh, and there was this whole period of reformation, which is when all of it split apart and it went out to the cities. We'll talk about that in a bit of time. Let's talk about the, the patronage till the bigger to that place. So, I mean, um, yeah. for the the positive family is going to make this quick. So, the patronage, of course, as most of you would know, the kings patronized the art forms and the people <coughs> really patronized it. So, it's not just the kings and the courts, but it was part of the social belief. So, um, uh, I remember the Rani Valley of the Kanamadama taught me two distinct repertoires one called the Koil Sadeh and the other called the Kotade Sadeh. Kotade was uh, like, a, like a little roof, thatched roof. But it's not literally a natural roof, it's any other performance outside of the temple. And the repertoire really was very, very vibrant there with different kinds of social events being part of this repertoire and, and things like that. But after a period uh, when, um, when, the, when the focus, economic focus of the nation and the political focus of, of the Tamil country moved from the villages, from these temples to the city, so to speak, Madras residency was formed. And uh, the patronage really quite shifted, and it was very interesting because when when we came to Madras, there were temples. There were, for example, the Chennai Temple in Georgetown was a very very important place for most artists to, and they also sort of migrated and lived around the Chennai Temple in Georgetown. However, it was not just the temple anymore, and not just the kings, of course. Uh, we, anybody who was wealthy, and uh, they also saw it as uh, a part of their own. Uh, life, life and lifestyle of duty to be a conversion of art. So most of these wealthy men had big, beautiful bungalows and those doors were open to art forms. Why? Because they had to throw lavish parties, so many tea parties and so many different kinds of social engagement. As you said, um, <laughs> she said before we started, said we didn't have an Asia house, right, in those days. So you would have big mansions that just opened up their doors and the host invited, you know, their guests to come and watch a particular dance who had come to dance or a new piece that had been created in that particular occasion, oftentimes dedicated to the host. Yes, and one of these patrons, I mean interestingly, is a Dubash. Uh, a Dubash is a Dubibasha, somebody who speaks two languages and is an interpreter. Typically, he would either speak French and the local language or English and the local language. So his his job was to mint money, not literally, but he would just mint money because he is the go between uh, between the British uh, merchant and the Indian merchant, right? So typically, when he'd go to the Indian merchant and say, "How much are you going to sell your bag of pepper for?" and the Indian Indian native merchant would say, "One rupee." or one pagoda, as they would call it. And then he'd look at the English master and say, Sir, he'd be willing to sell it for nothing less than five. So the English master would say, nothing more than four. So he'd turn around to the, the native and say, Sir says he cannot give you less than half or half, more than half and half a <laughs> So the poor fellow would say, fine. And so the rest of that goes into his pocket. And that's how most of Madras's most beautiful bungalows. <laughs> localities have been built, so the Lingo Pacetti Street and the Tango Pacetti Street, and this, all of these. One very important Dubash was uh, was uh, in the, not the court, but the, you know, in the favor of uh, Governor Pigot, who was, who was from here, and uh, his name was Manali Mutakrishnareddy. He made his fortunes, as I told you, this way, and he had this huge sprawling house at uh, a place called Govinda Panayakan Street, which was later actually named after him. Most of these streets were named after these wealthy merchants. 
And so he, he was a huge patron of our arts. And uh, should I do that piece? Yes. Okay. So typically, when they hosted parties, they were actually to celebrate their deeds, done, done deeds, right? So they would invite this poor merchant, English merchant officer, who thought he made a great deal, and uh, he, they, he would be the chief guest. So many a times, General Bigot was actually his chief guest uh, so to his parties. So here he was a patron of so many artists, including Muthuswami Dikshita, one of the Trinities, and his father, Ramaswami Dikshita. But uh, the names that she's mentioning as these uh, great composers are venerable gurus. They are considered Vimurtis, the three deities of South Indian classical music. And they were living human beings who created works, which dances of those days dance. And they were performed in these uh, salons and uh, other performances. Yes. In fact, Ramaswami Dikshita's second son, Ramaswami Dikshita, is just a side anecdote. He learned the Western violin, the fiddle, and introduced that as part of Carnatic music under uh, Manali Muthu Krishna Mudali's patronage. So, uh, going back to the other uh, poet he patronized, his name was Shivaramaya. He was from, a, from another town called Karu. And this Shivaramaya was commissioned to write something that excited this uh, British uh, guest, yes. right? Chief guest or guest. And uh, guess what Shivaramaya wrote? He wrote a beautiful javali, which is a sort of amorous poetic piece, which is very peppy and nice. And Javali was a very, very important genre at that period because it was quick poetry, it was almost sort of a, like a lyric sometimes. And uh, he just didn't write a Javali, not just a Telugu Javali. He said, why don't I write it in English? So he wrote a Javali and he said, oh my lovely Lalana. Oh my lovely Lalana. And then he would go on to say, Itu Vandi step. Is it fit to take? Is it a toy, dear? You can say it's quite English in the right. same sentence. Um, this is in Kanadar Priya. He said it in this ragam. He, he notated it. So nothing has been meddled with 17th century, 18th century. So here is uh, uh, oh just a sliver of Oh My Dabi We would be performing the whole piece at the performance. Oh, my God, dear, 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 dear,
working with John Wolf in the courts as well as for um, some of the performances. One thing we didn't mention yet is we're calling this whole way of dancing, this whole repertoire, as Sakya. That word itself doesn't come from Tamil, or nor did it. It comes from Urdu. So what do you want to speak about? Yes, so very interesting because just like Alaru, Alar, which, which has the same meaning in so many languages, including Tamil and Telugu. Alaru in Telugu would mean flower. Alaru in Tamil would mean flower. Uh, so interestingly, Sadir is a term that you can find in Persian, Urdu, Telugu, Sanskrit. And then, of course, when it became Chaturam, it became part of Tamil. But the meaning, of course, uh, varies in different places. Interestingly, one has not been able to find out what it really originally meant. But uh, of course, later on, scholars have been saying Chatura because it is supposed to be very scholarly, and then ch Chatura because it is it performed in a sort of a, a sort of squarish environment. But that isn't probably how the term really originated because. If you look at the Persian and the Urdu origin, in Urdu, for example, uh, particularly the Dhapini Urdu, I'm sure that's how it is in the north as well, in the Urdu as well. Um, Kacheri, for example. Kacheri is also a, is a borrowed term from Urdu. You know, it, uh, uh, any, any participatory, litigation really is Kacheri. So anything participation, where there is an audience and then they, they also respond and then something, somebody else is having a conversation with them. This space is really called a Chatura Kachi. So uh, most of the courts, the Adalas, in the north, even today if you go to places like Adalasa, you have yeah, you have Kacheri streets or Kacheri road. Even in Madras we have a Kacheri road. So the idea of the Chat the Sadir being a gathering is perhaps uh, one of the ways we can look at the term. The other yeah, one is when they say Sadarbo. Mm -hmm. which means when the, the head person is present, is coming in. So it's an announcement, so and so southern law, which we have in, in, in the languages we understand it, as being uh, an announcement uh, of, of the seat being taken by the chief guest for whom the performance is being done. So it's, what's most interesting for you to note from that is that there is no purity in this. What's interesting is how these words have all been taken and then given a meaning and, and how multi-vocal, multi-focal, multicultural these courts were and therefore the performances were. I just want to, uh, we're going to go and, and we're going to do some more which, which explores the short kind of aspect there. Sure, I could, uh, I mean, depending on the time we have. At least in the performance, tell us what you're going to be. Oh yeah, so I mean, we're going to be seeing some very interesting pieces. Um, Starting from Adora Salam, uh, we've actually handpicked uh, pieces from different places that, uh, that I've been able to gather and learn. Uh, we are also not just looking at these other performers uh, who performed uh, from the Hindu traditions, so to speak. As I said, I think they broke free from that sort of a religious uh, setup. We also looking at the Nawabi tradition. So the Nawab culture in Madras was very, very strong. The Arkar Nawab or the Karnatic Nawabs of the Karnatic, they were great patrons of art. Uh, so when their court, uh, so for, for example, Saladullah Khan, who was one of the Arkar Nawabs in the 18th century, he was a very, very uh, strong patron of the arts and he also brought a lot of Sufi saints from across India and from places like Afghanistan and other places to come and reside in Madras. So they wrote beautiful Dakini Urdu poetry. And the Tawais in the court of Sadatullah Khan, for example, most of them, they were called, not Tawais in the south, they were called as Kanchinis. So there, was, there were over 400 Kanchini families uh, in the Triplicate area. Some of them still live there, their families live there. So these women practiced beautiful music that was a wonderful confluence of Hindustani and Karnatic because they lived in the south, right? So it was very interesting. So I'm performing a, a tumbi written by uh, one of the Sufi saints and performed by one of the Kanchis. I'm performing a Parsi Jamali and uh, I'm performing a bunch of other very interesting pieces with a lot of uh, history pepper in it. Yes. And I think it also. 
So uh, sing a little bit of that classic uh, called the Do tell them about that theme. Oh yeah, so if, if there are Urdu uh, noises here, what you hear is Dhakini Urdu. So if it sounds very Madrasi, then that's how it's supposed to be. J
for which forbade the um, dedication of women to temple service. Um, and, and in spite of that, all the dancing still continued because so long as it didn't happen in the temples. Now, in the 1940s, you find the anti notch movement has taken, um, notch was the term that was used, imported from the north for notch, notch, N A U T C H, as the English started to call it, with all the English and the Scots and everybody in, in, in India. So, by the time it came to the 1940s, the, um, the, the legislation was already going through the courts. The whole the debate had actually went on for about a hundred years before the law was actually passed. Um, and it was not completely affected by the British or by the educated people. So it was, it's a very complex history, and I think, and there's enough evidence out there. We need to actually read the resolution. We need to see how the men from the same day with Nazi communities supported this resolution, because the women were ruling the roost in these communities, and, and the property was all really being handed down. And so they fought this reformation when the big women sit at home. Suddenly they become the dance teachers and they get the opportunity, and which is exactly what happened. So after that, it was like in my dance teacher's home, the girls never learned to dance. They would watch us all coming and going and dancing. And Tia Pillay talks about it. She's Rajaratna Pillay's granddaughter. And she was saying, Madhavika Sarute, and uh, all the others would come and learn. And my tata, my grandfather, told me, you can learn, but don't expect to perform. Um, we don't dance. We don't perform in public. So that was a complete reversal that happened. And so it's a complicated history, and I think those of us who are interested in dance, we should really make an effort to study it properly. But anyway, once it went off to 1940s to dance, now what is, what's, what's in another direction, for example, lost all her performances. She didn't have that male on her teacher, her guru. So she was continuing to perform for small weddings and so on and so forth. And the rest of them went off to join the music industry, uh, the film industry, uh, the recording companies had just come out and suddenly we get an MS Civil Luxury and, and society picks and hand picks which of the these David Dasis they want to actually support because they had turned uh, very much the model of the respectable Brahmin of the past. Uh, woman. So there's a lot of politics um, in that. But what I was trying to go back to is, again, the Ripley who was teaching us in Bombay, if Kevin has a large chance for performance, he will create one piece in Mayadi. If the Maharashtra Mandal asked us, he create one piece in Marathi. He would just take in Gujarati and perform. And he took the Tamil was one Marathi song which had actually filmed for a movie, Ghanashama uh, Sundara, which I um, or he would use uh, Hari Tumaharu, a simple bhajan and make a whole drama out of it. Or they took a completely new composition and created. When I look back at what he did, at that time I thought, oh my god, he's so avant-garde. I mean, he, he wants to do new stuff and he doesn't care what people say. I really has he has very good lineage and very good reason and history to do it. And he comes from this multi vocal, multi historical, multi language, uh, multi cultural background in his in his club, in his lineage. It was for a particular point in time that we forgot it and we invented this this whole idea of Bharatanatyam. Um, so to say Sadhir became Bharatanatyam before we make that casual transition, I think there are a lot more steps to understand. This whole idea that, uh, see, I'm not a Sadhir, I'm not a Devadas, and we all know that. So what claim do I have as, a, as an upper caste body to dance this Sadhir? Now this is the question that I started my, my entire quest with, uh, because I felt like I was stealing from this community. And it was after working with them, uh, and also when my own personal politics uh, changed that I realized something that the idea that there is empowerment in assertion. In fact, Ambedkar talks about it a lot. Ambedkar, you know, who's one of the founding fathers of social justice in India, he talks about the idea that we must assert. And this we is not just the community. So, in many ways, when my guru said, I don't want to talk about my Devadasi lineage, 
and she she didn't want to acknowledge that. I think the fact that I was able to uh, I was able to assert it, and I was able to work with women who who through through my work with them, we were able to reassert the fact that I'm able to call what I do today as Sadhguru. Uh, this assertion is very very important. This is social mobility, and this is very important. And who am I in doing this? I am the body who is not the subaltern. The subaltern is clearly them. And the subaltern has a voice of its own. And I'm very aware of that. I belong to the class of people who have been the oppressors. And I acknowledge that. And in that acknowledgement also lies this huge ability to move ahead. In fact, both Gandhi and Ambedkar again talk about this idea of camaraderie between the two oppressors and the oppressed. And unless we hold hands, and unless we move forward, unless we assert, um, it's very difficult. So it's wonderful when people from the community reassert their art form, reclaim their identity. And it's also equally important that others begin to assert, help in assertion, and also be a part of this journey in a very, uh, as, as comrades really, together. And to me, I'm not the subaltern voice, but I'm the voice that using my place of privilege, using my, using my, acknowledging my privilege, my voice allows for the subaltern to, to be seen, for the subaltern to, to be heard. Uh, so to me, it's a journey together with them. And I think that's how I, I visualize everything that I do. So I don't really feel like I am them because I am not them. And every time I acknowledge that I'm not them, I'm also silently showing to the audience that they are them and therefore they are there. And so to me that journey is very important and I think that's why Sadhguru is that much more relevant even today. It is not, uh, I'd like to again say this, you know, it is not a, a dance of the past. It's not just a precursor of Bharatanatyam. So it's not just something that is in the past, we've just dusted it and brought it back. It's so relevant and contemporary. So it has more potential, I would say, to speak to all kinds of audiences and all kinds of people, people of different classes, and to have the social mobility that I am afraid um, a very uh, normative form like Bharatanatyam has disallowed itself to have. I do want to, um, I, I will not be able to agree entirely with you because my uh, first question was upper caste woman, upper caste woman, what are we doing here and why in London? But the important thing is for you to know that we do think about it that we are not just blindly exoticizing. And if I'm exoticizing, I'll tell you why I'm exoticizing. When I want you to challenge and ask why we're we doing this. So this is because we need to get this, this topic back into the discourse. And now uh, we are, I think, grown up and mature enough to do that. The one thing we don't seem to be able to still get our heads around is, and from there we go into questions with friends, um, because a lot of dancers, when they do see southern pieces come back on this, they have said, what looks like poor Bharatanatyam? This is something I mentioned earlier. Even Anna Pradhavaras is with these times. I mean, she was criticized as, as not having the clean lines and, and, and that we got accustomed to, uh, that we've seen, even as ballet improves itself. I mean, if you see ballet for 500 years, you see the virtuosity that you find now and the, and the kind of lines that you see for the one contemporary now um, is, is different from when it was started. And um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit, you, you didn't want to say as pedagogy, but what was the whole look of the, of the dance forms and what was the idea? I think broadly speaking, the shifting aesthetics is really the crux here. The idea that what we today see as aesthetic and what we see as beautiful and what is palatable to the eye as Bharatanatyam, as, as it fits our image of this form. In fact, I remember a scholar um, you know, in India made this very interesting observation that most of our classical forms are identified, or most of our Indian forms are identified with their costume. If you wear a slightly different costume, you might not even identify the form of dance. For example, if you do Mohini Atta with a Bharatanatyam costume, uh, a person might actually think you're dancing Bharatanatyam, you know, very often, unless you know you're a trained eye. So it's the costume really that defines the art form in many ways. So we have created this caricature so to speak, of these forms. Uh, so it's very important for us to sort of uh, break free from that and we don't have to do it because it's not on our shoulders, it's already been done. All we have to do is just 
look to these people who have led such uh, wonderfully liberating lives through their art form. And, uh, and all we need to do is just open our minds a little bit and acknowledge that we've been fortunately, unfortunately, part of a journey of this art form, a post-colonial uh, journey that has, that has um, negated much of its vibrancy not just in, in its repertoire, but also in the kind of people, the kind of bodies that have engaged in it. So to me, acknowledging, re-acknowledging those bodies and re-embodying that as someone from the outside, but very aware and we're always acknowledging them, I think to me that is the best way of sort of bringing this back in a, in a cycle. That's why I said Sunday coming back to London uh, in a way is, is to be much larger than Swarnamalia performing in London. This, I'm very grateful for this opportunity personally. But to me, sudden coming here is even bigger, much bigger than anything else. So picking up on what you said, wonderful and joyous and joyful. Um, I was wondering if we talk, uh, do a little bit of notice for um, yes. the way we incorporated the Western sure. interpretation. So we didn't stop with English lyrics, we also went into English music. Uh, so we, um, this notice for them I learned, this particular piece, uh, I'm doing a very small excerpt from Mirali Malay and Sikaramalama. This was performed in the temple when the officers came during the temple festival to pay a visit to see if everything was going fine. Right, so these British officers would come. There's a very delightful picture of painting in one of the temples. Uh, if you want, you can Google it. I'm sure it's available somewhere. It's a 19th century painting in Koneri Rajapuram temple. There's a, there's a whole Southern party, dancers and musicians. And then there are two British officers standing on the other side and they are being welcomed into the temple. So this piece will uh, really reflect the, uh, the uh, how we invite their music. Reverend Schwartz was uh, a very important uh, Dutch missionary who came and notated most of this and his band notes are still available for us in the archives. Uh, but I learned this from the Kanamalo. We won't do the British anthem, but if you want to see that, you should come to the performance. <laughs> we don't have the time. But trust me, this anthem will blow you away because it's. Uh, no, I won't give away what it is. <laughs>
comparison to modern day Parathenantian by talking about how modern day Parathenantian is actually uh, quite conservative and um, said there was a very multicultural form with multiple influences that kind of absorbed and responded to the life society and environment at that time. So I'm curious to know, was there any conservatism at all that existed in that time and in that context? And if so, what kind of things did people want to preserve or were not so enthusiastic about at all? So I think uh, when we say conservatism, I think what you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what you mean is whether there were strict rules and grammar that that Southern didn't have. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, all forms of art uh, have a pedagogy, has a grammar, and but then what is interesting is when times require for you to assimilate, you know, you don't shy away from, from that. Uh, for example, every one of these gestures, for example, the salam was Mughal influence. Uh, the salute, of course, is the British influence. So this, they never shied away from absorbing as as uh, Ji was just talking about Balantanapile using these repertoire to, you know, so this idea that even actually Bhatnatyam does that, right? Bhatnatyam dancers world over, they've won the world stage by performing Varnams in uh, Sanskrit and uh, Gujarati and all of that. So the idea, uh, we have borrowed the idea. Bhatnatyam has not, has not been not taking from Sadhir. It has been taking from it, but rather slightly, I can say that. So we've taken, but we just we just packaged it very differently. So Sadhir does. I mean, if you look at some of the masters, particularly the Natyanas, very interestingly, they sort of stuck to their guns and said, "This is how." For example, Subhrai Kriyadi. I learned with him his very very last few years. He was 91 until he was he passed away in 93. I went to him. He was really senile, very very old, but. One thing he kept saying repeatedly was, this is how my grandfather, which was Meena Shudra would do it. So he didn't want to budge. Whereas the women, interestingly, because they were the performers, I think they met different kinds of people, they were they were really in the midst of all of this. Uh, like Muttagana Malama would, if I change a particular thing, you know, as I did it, either because I forgot or because I felt like improvising, she would actually stop and say, this is very nice. And she would get up and try it herself. So this, I found this difference between the men and the women, but largely I'd say that Sadhur also has its, its boundaries, any form does, but it's not restricted, restricted in, in a certain sense. One of the things that they did preserve um, are the musical compositions, because none of the dances exist separate from the text that was written for it. It was also embodied in the women being taught, and it's only when the women stopped performing uh, and they kept performing for themselves. You know, the, the Andhra Pradesh uh, Devadasi Dedication Prevention Act had amendments that went all the way to 2009. So they've been amending the act and amending the act. Um, and, and, and these women are actually even performing for themselves. And if you read some of the books like uh, Dabir Soreji, he's got ethnography there, where he's got actual uh, interviews with these Dasis. And you can see what, what is, they actually talk about where is it preserved? Is it preserved in your body? Is it in their memory? And what does it actually mean? Uh, actually, that's a very interesting point. When I worked with the NCW for, for three years, we were doing this survey of uh, the remaining Devadasis across four, four states. And Tamil Nadu, uh, particularly, um, most of them, their memory of every form of their uh, repertoire was in the music. They didn't remember the dance at all. Actually, and they were too old to, to get up and show it anyway. It was the music. So the minute I sang, I sang the piece, it would just jog their memory, they'd sing along. And as they sang along a couple of times, the hands would just flow. It would flow differently different, at different times. But the fact that that repertoire is embedded in their memory came through the music. So without that music, I think it would all be lost. Which comprise the Marathi Nirupadas. 
I just want to know, if, you know was that Darren's or was, was that also called Sadir? Because there was no mention of Bharatanatyam as well at that point. Right? Yes. And does the Sadir repertoire have any relevance or any um, relation with the Nerupadas of Kochi yes. Raja? That's a great question. See, the, actually, the term Sadir and Bharatanatyam and Devadasi, these are all sort of, I think, used more by us. Sadhir finds its uh, place in the, actually we find it in the inscriptions and the endowment copper plates. So they say Sadhir artists or Sadhir uh, Artaka or whatever, you know how they're yeah, given in some... Yeah, the endowment. endowment. So that's where you actually find the, uh, in fact when the Tanjok Wattis write a letter to uh, Sarkoji for some other reason, they say we are the dance masters teaching Karnatic and Hindustani dance. That's what they say. They don't even use the word Bharatanatyam or Sadhir or any of it. Right? So the Nirupanas, interestingly, all of them were danced. Because you see other you see Sherva, you see all of these repertoires part of the Nirupana. It was meant to dance, meant to be danced. Again, if you go back to my original, my PhD research, I have looked at how the Nayak repertoire of Mukachali and uh, all of these repertoires moved into sort of regurgitating into Alaru and Sherva and all of this. And then how that sort of again gave way to uh, what, in fact the Tantra Quartet have also been part of teaching Shevas and Alazus and other, uh, other Chodikas and other things. They've actually written a lot of Chodikas themselves and Swarapalavis. These are all almost, they were finding their way out. But Nirupana was definitely danced to and interestingly uh, all the 1918 pieces were done in the same round. Brilliant, right? I mean, imagine how much art and musical like artistry they must have. If you make Bhairavi, 19 pieces in different compositions. You, you would have to, yeah, you have to be a master of Bhairavi to be able to do that. And the same story as well. Absolutely. So, so you do find that the repertoire has is accumulative. They don't sort of just drop something and then move on. They push and pull and hand and then sort of it grows. So we uh, out of time. Yeah, I mean, just a minute. I just want to say how how precious it is for me uh, to have this opportunity to bring musicians. Because Southern without live music uh, is like a person without much life, right? So for uh, me and all the partners, uh, Sama Arts and Academy and uh, ICCR and Chitraji for for standing by this idea that. I will have to come with live musicians. I said, please, I can't do Sadhir without live musicians. And Meera Ji, you know, who understood what this is. I mean, to have three of them here is to me a greatest boon. So in a, in a huge way, I want to also thank my musicians. Um, Samhita. Thank you so much for giving for giving me this very beautiful opportunity. And on the, on the uh, performance days, they will also be part of the Sangeeta Bailiff Ensemble with their <coughs> gear. So, look out. So, thank you very so, much. Thank you very much, Chitra. She's test directed this whole uh, project. Thank you very much to Swan Malia. And thank you very much to the musicians. And we hope to enjoy their performances in other two uh, shows in Cambridge and in London on 30th. Please do return, um, and it will be wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to Asia House and Pamela for uh, really hosting this and starting the whole series of dancing dances here at this place. Thank you.